than a wicked in hip hop. Bad, bad, in a wicked in All right, I think we can get started today. Hopefully everyone are recovering from the deadline of the hash table project. How do you feel? No responses? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not recovered yet. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, a little bit administrative stuff still. Uh, we'll be releasing uh, homework four on Wednesday. It's due uh, actually uh, not that far away on November the 7th. And project three is um, due, um, oh, it's, it's already been released, right? It's due on November the 14th. And we actually also remember, uh, opened project to a practice, practice submission on Gridscope upon the request of some students. So that if you uh, still want to test your project to submission, especially if you need to build on top of it on later project, you can still uh, test that. <laughs> Uh, but one thing I actually need to emphasize a little bit here today is that we actually observed that many people only started, at least started their first submission on project two on the due date of the project or on the, on the original due date or on the extended due date of the project, right? So that is a very tight schedule that uh, many, some, some, at least some of the students are following. And in, at, at that point, it's actually a pretty difficult for the TAs and us to help you, right, if you are really on that tight schedule on the last one or two days uh, trying to finish that project. So just start early. Uh, otherwise, I mean, if you start on the last one or two days, it's just a very risky way uh, to um, ensure your normal progress in the class, right? So for project three, I would definitely recommend uh, to start early, okay? And then again, right after today's presentation, we will have actually the co-founder of Trino, a federated database query engine startup. He's going to talk about their query optimizer, right? So again, we just talked about the database query optimizer in the last two lectures. I think it will be pretty interesting if you could check out this database talk. We have links in my slides as well. Okay, so back to the content of today's lecture. Okay, I don't know whether uh, Andrew has showed this um, architecture or like this workflow of the database uh, system before, but essentially uh, so far in the semester, right, we have come all the way from the bottom to the top, right, disk manager, manager, et cetera, to uh, query planning. This, if you will, could be described as the um, linear workflow or cycle of a query. And for all the components we talk about, right, they are kind of independent, right? For example, how do you uh, manage the access of a page on the disk doesn't really affect much of uh, how you uh, perform a join or how you perform um, a, a, sort, a sort algorithm, et cetera, right? But there are other uh, components of the database system, namely uh, concurrency control and recovery that actually uh, just uh, permeates uh, different uh, components of, or, or uh, parts of the database system that we uh, talked about earlier in the class, right? So that's why we actually haven't talked much about uh, the other two components yet, but they are actually very, very important to achieve the desired functionality of the database system. And to some way, you can argue that they actually help achieve the core functionality of the database system, which is to ensure a uh, quote-unquote acid property of the system, which, uh, which I'll give more details. But essentially, there are two other components that permeates uh, different parts of the system, would touch how you execute a query, how you write pages uh, in and out of the disk, et cetera, uh, that are very important to the database system uh, that we are going to uh, talk in uh, this, today's lecture as well as a following uh, a few lectures. <laughs> so what are those? Well, why we need those additional components. So before talking about the details, I'd like to give you a few uh, motivation, right? So, so far we talk about how we execute queries in a database system, right? At least how to execute a single query. But what if, I mean, in many practical cases, the database could have many clients, right? And, and for example, this could be a bank, then many users could log into the bank, transfer their money, et cetera, et cetera. Then what if there could be uh, different users or clients that are trying to modify the same record? Right. What if one give one, one value, the other give another value? How do you ensure right, the correct, ensure the correct value is not uh, being overwritten, et cetera? Right. This is called a risk condition. And the other is, hey, what if there's a failure, there's a power failure, for example, during the execution of some of your queries? Right? For example, if you want to transfer $100 to my bank account, what if that the database already took $100 out of your account, but they haven't put it in my account? Then there's a power failure here. 
Right? How do we deal with uh, such an uh, issue? That would be uh, called the correctness of the database state. Right? So these are the issues, uh, very important uh, challenges that the database system deal with uh, so that it can ensure the good property of the data. So be more specific, the first issue about the risk condition would deal with the challenge of you, you lost certain updates, and then the mechanism to deal with that would be called concurrency control. And that's what we, call, we are going to talk about today, as well as in uh, the remaining uh, three lectures, actually. We are going to talk uh, quite a bit on that. And for the second property, what if there is a data loss uh, on uh, the power failure, that's what we, uh, that would be called the durability property that the database system is going to achieve. And the method to cope with that would be called recovery. And we are going to talk about that later in the class as well. Okay. <laughs> So uh, to emphasize a little bit about the importance of the uh, concurrency control at the repar re uh, recovery, they actually just provide the uh, fundamental or dis the most distinguishing uh, property, if you will, of database systems. And again, I mentioned it a little bit, it would be called acid property. Essentially, it's a way to let developers to uh, uh, conveniently handle their data without worrying about those, hey, correct value got overwritten by another user, hey, what if there's a power filter, etc., etc. So that the users can focus on the core logic of their application, right, to develop features, generate the business value of their application. And uh, because that's when you are developing an app or developing a software, that's what you want it, right? You want your features that can help your user and generate values, etc. And then the database system will be handle those, uh, I mean, complicated data issues for you. And of course, there are different types of uh, performance metrics or properties that you want the system to have, and that's why you have many, many different database systems, right? Providing different performance guarantees and a little bit different uh, data consistency or durability properties at times uh, to the application. But at the end of the day, this actually releases uh, the developers, if you will, to focus on the uh, more important logic of uh, uh, developing their application and generate corresponding values for the user. Okay, <laughs> so today we'll start with uh, transactions, about, uh, aka the uh, concurrency control, uh, the, and in the uh, next few weeks we'll talk about recovery. So to be a little bit formal, essentially a transaction would be a, the execution of a sequence of one or more uh, operations, typically would be uh, SQL queries, on a database to perform a uh, higher level functionality. Right? So when I see higher level function here, this could be the example of uh, you want to transfer or I want to transfer $100 from my bank account uh, to your bank account. Right? So the database system would actually not have an interface or query to say, hey, I'm going to initiate a uh, task of transferring $100, not really, right? These tasks are executed or implemented through a SQL queries. Maybe you first read your bank account, deduct 100, uh, a value of 100 from your account, and then read my account, and then increment 100 value from my account, right? Typically, these are performed through a set of uh, standard interfaces such as SQL queries. But then a transaction will just be a sequence of uh, such uh, small tasks or SQL queries that perform a higher level meaningful functionality, such as uh, to transfer $100 from your bank account to my bank account. <laughs> and then this transaction would just be the basic unit of database operations. And database wouldn't really allow partial changes to a system, right? So it wouldn't allow a set of um, queries that, that would be intended to fulfill such functionality such as transferring the money to just, uh, I mean, execute partially and then have this $100 money, $100 uh, lost in nowhere, okay? Okay, <laughs> so give you a more specific example. Let's move $100 from my account, for example, to a, a promoter of this class, right, to his or her account. And then the transaction would be ex the execution of a series of operations, again, typically SQL queries. In this case, could be a first check whether I have $100 in my account, and then deduct $100, and then add $100 to my uh, promoter's account. Right? This would be called a transaction. And this is execute either all or nothing. Right? This is like a basic unit of the operation. So how do we achieve that? So, well, we can actually imagine a, a strawman approach, right? Let's just start with that. How about we just enforce the system, right, to execute one transaction after the other, right? Just you just, if there's a transaction to transfer money, 
you ex execute that transaction. If that transaction is still executing, but the other transaction arrives, you just queue them up and then execute one transaction after the other. And then how to ensure that uh, the correct update is always uh, persists in the system? Well, what you can do is that you can, before the execution uh, of the uh, transaction, you can actually copy the entire database, right? Again, a very strong approach. You copy the entire database to a new file, <laughs> And then you mark, make all the changes to the new file, or deduct $100, uh, increment $100, et cetera. And then only when all the changes have applied successfully, then you actually uh, swap the database content from the old file to the new file, right? Just swap, swap a pointer in your internal database system, right? To point to the new data file with the updates, and then you delete the old file. So this would obviously uh, be correct, right? You don't really have the uh, issue of uh, multiple users updating the same record with the different uh, correct results got overwritten because one execution at a time. And also it ensures durability, right? <laughs> so because when you, before you finish uh, editing the new file, right? Finish the execution of this transaction, everything would be persist on old file, right? And if there's a power failure, then after you come back, you just realize, hey, I haven't swapped my database file from the old file to the new file, then you just remove the new file, right? But in the case of the transaction successfully finished, you made all the changes, then you just swap the, swap, swap the database to the new file to point to the new file, then nothing on the old file would still matter. Right? So this would ensure the, the concurrency control property as well as the, the, the ensure the challenge of the lost data records as well as uh, ensure the uh, uh, durability property, right? So that it can recover from the incomplete state. Does that make sense? It's a simple, naive approach. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, uh, one issue with the simple approach would be that it could potentially be slow, right? So, uh, what would be ideally one is actually to uh, allow multiple transactions to be executed at the same time so that in the, they can interleave the operations. And why is that? <laughs> well, there are two reasons. Because the first is that I mean, modern database or not modern uh, data system or like uh, uh, machines will actually be a multi-core, right? So if you only allow one transaction to be executed at a single time, well, of course, I mean, that's correct. There's no overwritten. But then, I mean, if your machine has 10, 20, 40 cores, only one core will be utilized, a very low uh, data utilization, right? And also everything is queued up, also increase the data latency. <laughs> and furthermore, many database operations could actually uh, read data or write data from the disk, right? To, to interact with the data on the uh, storage media. And in that case, if one transaction, it wants to read certain records, I mean, from, from a page, and the page is not in memory, it has to go read from the disk, which would take milliseconds, for example, right? And then while this is happening, if you use the naive approach, nothing else can happen, and right? the database system just stalls. And what you really want to do, or what you want to, one of the SP system, system to be uh, more efficient is that you could, while waiting for one transaction to read one record from the disk, you could do a context switch and let the database system to handle the execution of the other transactions if they have available data already in memory, right? And if you have finished fetching records from the disk, you can just switch back and execute the original transaction. So this will result in overall higher utilization of the uh, hardware on the system and eventually would lead to higher throughput, right? That makes sense? Right, very straightforward, right? We, we want multiple transactions to be executed together, so we have higher throughput, lower latency. And of course, during the meantime, we, are, we need to ensure the correctness uh, of all the earlier properties we talk about, and then we also ensure, want to ensure fairness, right? Because if different, we are scheduling different transactions to execute concurrently, we don't want one transaction, I mean, to just starve for the resource wait forever. And of course, we want to execute the whole thing uh, efficiently. And, and this, by the way, this actually turns out to be very, very challenging, right? If you want to execute many things together to be correct, to be efficient, to be fair, and just like people are still uh, doing lots of development and continue to perform lots of organizations research in this space. And in fact, I mean, even with the Postgres they have a system, right? We mentioned a lot during this class, they actually still found, I mean, transaction bugs, right? Even last year, I think they still found one transaction bug in their system with a newer, um, testing framework called SQLancer that was developed recently, right? So again, uh, query optimizations uh, is pretty hard. Transactions are also pretty difficult uh, in the heavy systems, all right? So to uh, be a little bit, uh, so to give you a, a little bit, 
motivation on, uh, on the uh, definition of the transaction, right? So here, when we talk about that we want to ensure the correctness of the database, there are actually uh, a little bit uh, subtle distinction here. <laughs> so consider a scenario, right? We just uh, arbitrarily uh, let operations to interleave it with each other. Well, well, this can have a higher throughput, higher uh, uh, performance, obviously, right? <laughs> but, and, but at the meantime, like I mentioned, I mean, data can uh, overwrite uh, records, can be overwritten by different transactions, data can be lost, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but there can actually two types of uh, incorrect behavior, or you can call it inconsistency behavior, uh, lead by arbitrary uh, interleaving operations in a in, among different transactions. The first would be really called temporary inconsistency, Right? This is a kind of like unavoidable uh, middle state while you're executing a transaction. For example, if you want to uh, transfer $100 from my account uh, to your account, then during the middle of that higher level operation, there must be a state that there could be $100 extracted from my bank account, right? But it has not been put to your bank account yet. And in that case, the database are sort of in a wrong state, or in, in formal called the inconsistent state. But that's just kind of unavoidable because right? you haven't finished the transaction. But that's fine. <laughs> but there are another type of uh, inconsistency called permanent inconsistency, right? For example, if during that happening, I right, already deducted $100 from my account, but then there's a power failure. Right? And when you come back, somehow you cannot realize that this is an incomplete transaction. And your database is just left in a state that $100 deducted from my account, but not put in your account, uh, your account yet. And if the database system left in that state permanently, well, that is bad, right? That's the uh, thing that we want to uh, avoid. So essentially, there are different type of inconsistencies. Some would be allowed, some would be not allowed. So what would be actually be the formal definition of correct here, right? For these uh, transactions uh, executing databases. So that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so uh, firstly, uh, to clarify a few uh, basic uh, concepts that we are going to uh, define in this class. <laughs> so first, a transaction would carry uh, multiple operations uh, on the data from the database, right? Could it be read or write from different records, etc. <laughs> and then uh, for the purpose of the database transaction, it's actually only concerned about the content of the data, right? But not everything else. <laughs> so uh, it, be, it sounds a little bit uh, abstract. For example, if there's one transaction that is um, executing some user logic outside the control of the database, right? For example, it can, again, uh, transfer $100 from deduct my account to your account, but in between, right? Let's say, first it deduct, deduct $100 from my account, but then after that, it somehow send an email, right, to the users from the outside world, hey, uh, this $100 has been deducted, we are doing this transaction, or we complete. But then, before the transaction finishes, uh, there's, there's a power failure, right? Let's say the transaction abort. Then, well, well, abort would be the concept we'll talk about later, but let's say just the transaction could not get finished. Then in that case, the email is already sent, right? The database system just cannot deal with the fact that there's some uh, application logic written by the user that have some external effect outside the scope of the data on the database system, right? That's just not what the transaction can, can deal about. Transaction only focus on the read uh, and, and write on the data uh, in the database, all right? And then, for the purpose of uh, this lecture, we're actually going to uh, define the set of uh, operations uh, the database, uh, sorry, the transaction is going to perform on the database would be on a fixed set of uh, named objects, right? For simplicity, we just denote them as uh, A, B, C, et cetera. And we uh, note that there are, there are two important things here when we are defining the, uh, the, the set of objects the transaction is going to operate on, right? The first is that I'm defining them as fixed, which means that for the purpose of this today's lecture, I'm just going to assume that I'm going only the transaction is only going, going to read or update on these objects, right? And obviously, transaction can also read the records, delete the records, etc. But then, I mean, these are to handle those are will be a little bit more complicated, and we'll, we'll talk about about them in a later lectures. But for today's, I mean, lecture is only a hundred an hour and, a, and a twenty minutes, right? So we are going to assume uh, the um, the objects will be fixed set, where we only focus on the read and update on these objects so far. And the second is that when I give uh, these objects the transaction is going to, going to be operated on as as just just simple names, we actually don't care whether these objects are, are either an entire table or a tuple or a page on the index, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Because the algorithm to deal with the uh, concurrent operations for them will actually remain pretty much the same, no matter 
what is really inside uh, the, the, the objects, as you will, you will see uh, later in the class, right? The algorithm would actually only care about hey, whether you perform a read or whether you perform the write, etc. Right? It wouldn't really care what would be the content of, of, of these objects. But just um, practically speaking, and also generally speaking, most most system uh, the transactions will actually operate on these objects at the tuple level, right? Even though the transaction concurrency control or transactional algorithm doesn't really uh, care, but most of the system would just uh, operate on tuple level since that's just uh, the uh, natural way to do it. And then we are going to define the transaction would just be a sequence of read and write operations on these objects, right? Denoted uh, as uh, read on A, write on B, et cetera, et cetera, okay? <laughs> and just to, again, uh, we are not show demos today, but we are actually going to show some demos in database system next, next lecture, right? So we actually very encourage you to come to the lecture uh, uh, this Wednesday as well. But essentially uh, the CQ way to uh, begin and end our transaction would be Again, to begin a transaction would simply be, uh, in most systems, would be through the begin command. And of course, this may vary a little bit among system to systems, but most of the system would just simply be a begin. And then to end a transaction, right, usually uh, there will be uh, two types of command, the, or, or two commands you, you, can, you can issue. The one type of command will be called commit command, uh, which just mean to indicate the system that you are done with the transaction and you want to apply all the changes uh, to make them durable uh, in the database uh, systems. And then the thing to note here, one important thing to note here is that if you are a user and tell the system to commit, the system actually doesn't guarantee that it will commit your transaction. Because in order to ensure all the uh, desired properties we talked about earlier, and also allow for concurrent operations, there could be cases that the system just uh, couldn't allow a transaction to, to commit. You has to, you has to uh, stop the transaction and roll back all your changes to ensure the desired property of the database system. And we'll talk, again, we'll talk more in this class, but the, the, the thing, important thing here to emphasize here is that when you tell commit, system will have, actually have the option to either successfully write all your records to a system, you are done, or the system may tell you that, hey, I cannot do that, and I have to abort. And, and of course, you can also directly tell the system to abort, which just means that, hey, I just figured out that I made some mistake, and just I cannot really, uh, Execute, continue to execute this transaction, or this transaction doesn't make sense to me uh, so far, so I want to undo all the changes to our database system. Right? Recall, transaction would be the basic unit of operation in the database system, so if you don't want to complete this transaction, you have to abort all the changes in the transaction and start all over again, okay? Okay, the last sentence would just say, hey, a board can either be you as a user to issue, or the system can do it on itself to ensure the property. So now, what are these uh, desired properties, right? So I talk again, gave this term earlier, but more uh, formally, this uh, fundamental or like, distinguishing property of the database system can provide to developers what we call asset, right? Some of them may actually heard of this term before, right? During our other exercise in our computer science class. So essentially, they will be just the abbreviation of atomicity, consistency, uh, isolation, and durability. So uh, let me just briefly uh, go over one by one. <laughs> so atomicity, just like I mentioned before, it just means that all the operations in the transaction are execute all at once, or we have to roll back everything, right? Assume this transaction didn't happen, right? This is the basic unit of the operation. <laughs> and for consistency, we're actually going to go a little bit light on this uh, in these few lectures. It will actually make more sense in a distributed setting, a single node setting, um, it does not matter that significantly. <laughs> but essentially, um, it, I mean, as it defines, it says that if a, if a transaction is consistent and the database state starts consistent, they, then it will end up in a consistent state. For this consistent, you can think of it as a um, desired property, right? For example, assuming that all the money transferring are within a single bank, right? Just assuming that, then a desired property would be that, hey, at the end of the day, no matter how you transfer the money, at the end of the day, all the total money of all the accounts in my bank would be stay as the same number, the same value, no matter how you transfer in between, right? That could be called a desired property. And the consistency would be, would be say that, hey, if you start the uh, transaction with a specific value, and if the transaction is just moving money in between accounts, then you just end up with the same value, right? For example, this could be a consistency uh, property or the, uh, desired um, uh, invariant of the database 
uh, you can you want to apply. <laughs> and then next, isolation, execution of one transaction as isolated from the other transactions. That's really an important concept that can really uh, ease the use of the users to deal with the data. Right. So when I'm issuing a transaction to a database system, I'm just uh, going to execute this transaction as if I'm the single solo user of this database system, right? So the, if there are some other uh, concurrent transactions that have some uh, updates that are happening in the middle, haven't committed yet, or in the process of uh, rolling back or undoing, then I should not be able to see any of these uh, partial effects, right? So I, I, I should, uh, I mean, when I'm dealing with the database system, I should only care about my own transaction, and as if that's the only transaction running the database system. This is a very, very important property, and we are going to expand more on this in this class that can ensure, uh, make, make the develop, make the user uh, to, to, be, uh, to use the database system much, much conveniently. And lastly, as all those straightforward durability, which means that if I have committed a transaction, then all the changes will be uh, persistent on a persistent media such as disk, right? You cannot lose data. <laughs> to, uh, to summarize them in short, atomicity means all or nothing. Consistency means that, hey, the database system looks correct to me, right? For example, the money in the bank account adds up to the correct value. Isolation, as if that I'm um, a single user of the database system, right? I mean, the executing this transaction alone. And durability means that if there's a power failure, my data would be on disk, right? Uh, or it can be recovered from disk. Uh, it's not going to uh, lose anything. So in, in this class, we're just going to uh, go over these properties one by one. But again, we'll be a little bit uh, light on the consistency uh, property. <laughs> oh, and also in today's lecture, I mean, things as you can see from the title of lecture, it's called Concurrency and Control Theory, which means that we are going to Talk about the high level concepts, right, of how the database system is going to uh, achieve uh, this property. But we are not going to talk about the specific algorithms or the implementation details, right, because there are just uh, much more of them we cannot cover in the single lecture. So today we are going to focus on a little bit about the uh, like high level uh, uh, methods or methodologies, if you will. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, actually, any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> so when we are, when we, I mean, already talked this a little bit, right? When we are executing a transaction, <laughs> the transaction essentially there will be uh, two possible outcomes, right? Just to uh, reiterate a little bit. The first would be it commits, which means that all the changes in the transactions have been applied to the database system, and then they are also durable on the disk, right? The other would be abort, which means that I mean, none of these actions, whether the actions that. Uh, has already been done, or the actions that haven't been done, none of the actions should have any effect to the database system. Right? Everything should be undo if it's already applied. <laughs> and it's the database system's property that to ensure uh, this uh, atomic uh, execution of the transaction. Right? It's not on the users, on us. <laughs> so to uh, give you uh, two examples of the uh, scenarios that uh, the service system, system need to uh, deal with, right? So the first scenario would be that, hey, again, the transferring money example, we want to take $100 off of my account, put it on someone else's account, but then the database system could abort in between, right? In this case, I mean, uh, it's just $100 just become missing uh, in the database system, right? This is not good. <laughs> the other scenario is that, hey, the, uh, the, uh, the, again, take my $100 from my account, but then the database system could actually uh, uh, experience a power failure. Right? In this case, we also need to ensure that the original state of the database system is going to be uh, successfully recovered. So again, there's no uh, money loss in this case. And then how do we ensure that? Well, there are essentially uh, two possible ways to deal with this uh, atomicity uh, property. <laughs> the first will be called logging. Right. So what this login do is that when before or, or when the database system is applying any change uh, to the tuples, right, or the data contents, it's actually while applying those changes. In the meantime, it write out what changes it has done uh, onto a log onto the disk. Right. <laughs> so essentially, if you want to modify the data, you have only need to have a backup on the disk to talk about what have been modified to it, to what value. Right. And then there are two benefits, right? It, or it serves the, both of the properties we talked about earlier. The first is that if somehow, right, there's a conflict, other user is, is modifying the data, we don't want to uh, overwrite some uh, correct value, then we can look at the record on the disk and then undo uh, what we have written right, to this record and to restore the value back to the original state. And then we can abort the transaction, right? 
that's the, solves the one case. It also solves the other case, right? If there's a power failure, uh, then what's have been written halfway is already uh, got lost. You don't know what's before and after the transaction, but you have the log on the disk, right? The, the log can tell you that, hey, I'm a I have a transaction that has did this modification, but it has not finished, right? So after I come back from power failure, then I can again restore to the original state. And, uh, and there are also other potential purposes, but are less important for the acid property, but for the uh, for some practical scenario, right? For example, if you want to satisfy some auditing uh, constraints, right? It's a very common scene in the banks. If an auditor wants to know, hey, who, who purchased this stock, et cetera, right? Trying to uh, uh, comply with a certain regulation, the, this logging could also be uh, useful, okay? And that's what most database systems uh, do, right? Like the, all, almost all the database systems would actually have this logging component to ensure automaticity. <laughs> but then when I say almost, then there's this implies that there's a different approach that a few database systems do, uh, very, very rare, but I mean that exists, which will be called a shadow paging, right? <laughs> so it's instead of, I mean, write the changes, what's before, what's after, onto a, a log record, onto the disk, what you can do is that you can, a little bit similar to the strongman approach, you can either copy the entire database state or copy the pages that you are going to modify, uh, I mean, to a separate place or shadow paging it and then do the modification there, right? And once you have finished all the changes of the entire transaction, you can switch, you can do a pointer switching, right? Switch the database uh, system to point to the uh, content that you've written in the new copy of the database system, right? And then this actually, uh, by the way, this is actually what been done in the first place uh, in the in the very first regional database system implementation or one of the first in, in, in system implementation system R, right? That's what they did. Because I mean, first that's like a straightforward, right? I mean, the, you, you shadow paging is like an established technique used in many places. <laughs> and also you don't have to go to this additional step, right? You write additional records onto the disk and with write could cause write amplification, amplification et cetera. Right? But the drawbacks would also be uh, we also have many drawbacks. Right? For example, you can cause loss of data fragmentation uh, when you start this uh, shadow paging. And, and also, um, you can uh, typically, if you do that, then you can only commit one transaction at a time, right? Because you have to switch data from the old copy, new copy, back and forth. And uh, essentially, system R abandoned that and uh, switched to a logging approach uh, later. And then most of the system uh, currently Almost, almost all the system currently also use the logging approach instead of this shadow paging approach. <laughs> but then there are also some systems do that uh, in very specific application scenarios, right? For example, uh, CouchDB, I think the first version of CouchDB did that, but I think later on there's also some variant that, I mean, switch to logging and there's another, another database called the level uh, LMDB. Uh, it, they also do it that way, but it's in very uh, rare cases. So uh, before I switch to consistency, any question? Yes, please. Uh, with the logging approach, how do you make sure that like, um, doing an action and putting the action in the log are uh, atomic? You can't have, you know, do an action and then the database crashes before you log that you did the action. Yes, yes. <laughs> So, well, actually, this getting out a little bit ahead of time. We'll expand that later. Like, again, this, this lecture focuses on high-level concepts, but essentially there will be a technique called write-ahead logging. You have to make sure that a set of changes to be a persist, or to be, uh, the log of a set of changes to be persisted on the disk first before you can actually apply the change. Right? But we'll expand that later. Yeah. Of course, there would also be performance issue related to that, so we have to optimize that as well. So, yes, yeah, good question. Cool. Next, uh, consistency. Uh, just uh, again, th this lecture is going to talk a little bit at high level, right? So uh, this consistency is trying to just trying to ensure that the quote unquote the word uh, represented by the database is uh, logically correct. <laughs> and then uh, when you ask the database system about with some queries about the database state, uh, it will uh, give you back a logically correct answer. Again, think of the example or example where if you are just transferring money within a bank. Then one potential it's not it's not like necessary, right? You don't have to define it. But one potential consistency uh, property you could have is that you at the end of the day you want the value of all the money in your bank bank add up as the same, right? <laughs> that could be a logical uh, property that you ensure uh, you you can ensure consistency on, right? Then again, uh, there are two types of uh, consistency, right? Before you execute a transaction, right, the database system could be uh, in a specific state, right? For example, if you declare 
all the money add up to be a specific value, then you can check whether any at any point in time whether the database system is actually indeed satisfied that property, right? That would be just called the consistency property of the database system itself. <laughs> and also, of course, for transactions, right? If your transactions is just moving money from accounts, but always ensure that if you move money out of one account, you always put the same amount of money to another account, then this transaction would satisfy uh, this uh, the consistency property you want as well, right? If the if the if there's one transaction that somehow magically put a million dollar in my account, well, then it will not satisfy the consistency property we defined earlier, right? Makes sense? Again, this would actually make more sense when we talk about the distributed database system. Uh, for now, for a single node database system, we, it's not uh, that, it does not matter that significantly, okay? <laughs> so what we will uh, spend uh, the most of the t time of this lecture is the uh, isolation property of the transaction, right? Again, this is a very, very important property that the database system provides for the users so that they can uh, conveniently uh, develop their applications without need to worry about, hey, data overwritten or like uh, some other transactions, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so again, <laughs> to, uh, oh, that, essentially this just uh, uh, summarize that, okay? So uh, essentially, this deal with the uh, interleaving issues of different users, like accessing different records, issuing account transactions at the same time. And then we need an approach uh, to ensure that uh, the database system can provide this uh, isolation property, right? That's the mechanism we are going to talk about, which will be called the uh, concurrency control uh, protocol, right? <laughs> so uh, to formally uh, define it, a concurrency control protocol is how the database system decides the proper interleaving of, rich, of, rich, of operations from multiple transactions that are happening concurrently, right? such that each transac transaction or each user would just uh, perceive the database system as executing that transaction alone, right? It wouldn't really uh, see any impact or effect of the concurrently executing or executed the transaction. Again, the mechanism to ensure that will be called concurrency control, right? very important uh, terminology. <laughs> and generally speaking, there are two types of uh, concurrency control uh, protocols. The first will be called pessimistic, right? So just from the name, we can tell that what it does is that it just assumes that uh, this uh, either a conflict or the overwritten, I mean, uh, of, uh, of different uh, concurrent transactions would actually happen uh, pretty often, right? So before the execution of each operation in your transaction, we have to do something, right, to ensure that, hey, my system is in a absolute uh, good state, right? So that before I execute anything, this thing would actually not cause any impact to other users right, in the database system, right? So that uh, every user would uh, have a, um, uh, I mean, isolated view right, of the database system, right? So that would be called pessimistic. You do something before the execution of every operation. And then the other high-level approach we call optimistic, right? Again, just from naming, you can tell that, <laughs> hey, this approach just assumes that the conflicts or the, uh, I mean, concurrent writing of users to a single record ha actually happen very rare. Uh, in the database system, right? So in this case, you just let different transactions to do whatever they want to do, right? execute things, but then before you, before the users want to commit a transaction, right? You're actually going to go back and check, hey, whether during the execution of my transaction, I have either uh, violated some property, right, or conflict with other transactions, et cetera, that right, cause the database system uh, in an invalid state, so that if that happened, I would actually only abort the transaction and roll back all the changes at the end, right? So that would be an optimistic approach, which is that transaction do what they, whatever they want to do, right, and check whether there's a problem at the end of the day or when they want to commit. So uh, give you some uh, examples of the uh, transactions right that could be executed right so they give you to make it a little bit uh, more concrete so assume that we have uh, two transactions in a database system right uh, a and b and then uh, transaction t1 wants to transfer hundred dollar from uh, uh, well, between two transaction t1 and t2 and then uh, there will be uh, two records a and b right <laughs> then uh, trans transaction t1 wants to transfer a hundred dollar from uh, a's account uh, to b's account and then transaction t2 will actually credit both accounts with a 6% of interest, right? 
And what we want to do is that we want to ensure that no matter how the database system interleaves the operations of the different transactions, right, so that they can actually work concurrently, at the end of the day, uh, the database system still have a uh, correct uh, state, right? And we, we will define that for more formally later, right? But intuitively, right, we can we can we can uh, we can look at what would be the possible result of these uh, two transactions and look at what would be uh, the a desirable uh, result, right? We can look at that intuitively first. So essentially, what we do is that we move money from one account to another, right? And then we credit both accounts with some interest. So one way to say that the transaction execution would have a correct result would be that, hey, at the end of it, like I mentioned earlier, you check the total amount of money of these two transactions, right? But in, but in this case, a little bit complicated because there will be the interest involved, but no matter how you apply the interest, like say before the money transfer or after, at the end of the day, the, the database system have the same amount of money, right? Or in the bank have the same amount of money. And after you apply the interest, it would still have uh, the same amount of uh, uh, money, right? In this case, it would be uh, $21.20, uh, right? And then, I mean, either way, I mean, no matter how you execute this transaction, T1 first or T2 first or interleave them, at the end of the day, we, we, want, we need to ensure the property that the, the bank or the debit system still have this amount of money in total, right? Otherwise, it will be incorrect. Yes, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Probably interleaving would be a better terminology. Yes, yes. Out outcome should always be the same. Yes, please. I think that different outcomes are starting to say, yeah, that like if you do the interest first, then A ends up with a bit more money. But if you do the interest second, then B ends up with a bit more money. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's just like a semantics, right? Essentially, the result of the end state of the database system would be a 20 to 20. And then we want to ensure that no matter T1 first or T2 first, it has, at the end of the day, it has the same result. I mean, you can call it outcome, right? Like, but it's just semantics, right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the, the possible outcomes? Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, in this case, I mean, as, as we define here, the outcome would be, uh, say, hey, what would be the, uh, the money left in the database system, right? Instead of this invariant property we, we talk about, in this case, there could be a different outcome, right? So in one case, uh, the uh, account A could have uh, like a one, one type of one, like a number, right? Before, if the credit uh, the, to the transfer before the interest apply, but in other case, if you do the transfer after the uh, interest apply, it could have a different uh, uh, amount of money in, the, in each account, right? And then this outcome could be actually uh, be different, but at the end of the day, if you end up don't have the same amount of money after the interest as we talked about earlier, right, is 20 to 20, then the DIB system would be an incorrect state, right? Yeah, in this case, in both cases, it adds up as the same amount of money. So I'll we'll give you some examples, right? Some simple examples would be here, right? You first execute a transaction T1, right? And then you execute a T2, right? It will be on the left. And the, uh, the other case, you can reverse the order, right? I mean, you can check the numbers here, but no matter in each case, at the end of the day, I mean, the total amount of money after the interest I mean, in, in, the, in the entire bank or the database would actually end up to the same, right? And any value other than that would be incorrect. So uh, again, this is just a little bit reiterate on why it's important to interleave in transactions. Well, because we want to improve the throughput, we also want to reduce the latency, right? While we are fetching some records on the disk, we want to uh, slip in some operations from other transactions to the system, right? So that we are not just, so, so that the data system don't just stall and wait uh, forever, or not forever, but just wait uh, uh, like, uh, for the records to come back without utilizing any resource. Right? And in the multi-core system, we also want to execute, uh, 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 execute transactions uh, concurrently right, to improve the total throughput. So what would be the uh, possible interleaving uh, of transactions? Right? So in this case, what we can uh, do, i just give you one example, is that we can first, I mean, in the transaction T1, deduct the $100, and then, in T2, we can actually uh, apply the interest on the account, I mean, after the deduction, right? We can already apply the interest there. But then after that, we can put the $100 on the other account and then apply the interest on the uh, $100 on the other account later, right? 
And in this case, I mean everything, uh, or, or like the end, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the 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 total amount of money will actually remain the same, right? And in fact, the end result of uh, this uh, this transaction would be the same as you execute the entire transaction, entire operations in T1 first, and then execute the entire operations in T2 later, right? So. Uh, even though these operations are interleaved, at the end of the day, you still ensure this correct property, right? Make sense? This will be uh, valid. So what do we invalid? <laughs> right here, right? For example, if you T1 first deduct the $100, and then T2 first multiply uh, the, uh, the, this like, um, uh, value, the account, uh, the balance in A, deducted by $100 by this interest, and then before transfer the money, if the transaction T2 immediately apply the interest, right? And then later on, transaction T1 finally uh, increase this uh, $100 to the account B. Then in this case, there's like a, some amount, amount, amount of money, in this case it will be $100 in the account B, have not been applied the interest, right? In this case, the total amount of value would be different, and then I mean, the bank is missing like $6, right? This would actually be bad, right? So uh, this, in this case, uh, this transaction would actually uh, fail, and then this is like a very bad state um, you, you can end up with if you are operating a bank, right? You never want this to happen. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, just uh, uh, to, to, to loop back a little bit uh, about the uh, transaction uh, definition we talked about earlier, for the purpose of the transaction, right, it only cares about what records it is accessing and whether it's read or write those records, right? It actually, that for the, from the transactions perspective, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't know whether, hey, this is a tuple, uh, this is a bank account, this, is, this even could be an index page. It doesn't really matter, right? It only knows that, hey, whether I'm reading the data or I'm writing the data. And here, in this case, I'm just, uh, I, mean, I mean, writing the uh, property on these operations as using the notation we talked about earlier, right? This could be read on A, write on A, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what the database system sees, at least from the uh, concurrency control perspective, that's the concurrency control component uh, of the database system sees, instead of the uh, concrete semantic meaning of these records, right? Whether it's A and B, et cetera. Make sense? It's very important, right? So now, we finally, we can talk about uh, how do we define uh, whether the transaction execution is uh, correct or not, right, with many examples and, and motivation. <laughs> so, so we define a transaction scheduling, or like an operation interleaving order in plain English, right? but more formally, the scheduling of the transaction uh, is correct if the schedule is to equivalent to some uh, serial execution of the transactions, okay? Okay, sorry, yeah. So um, we define, eh? okay, uh, sorry, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to expand the uh, concept here, right? So a serial schedule of the transaction, which means that there, would mean that a scheduling of a sequence of transaction execution without any interleaving uh, of operations, right? In the other example, it would be T1 after T2 or T2 after T1, right? That would be called a serial uh, schedule of a transaction execution, no interleaving. And then e what equivalent schedule means that is that if for any database state, the effect of executing the first schedule is identical to the effect of executing uh, the second schedule, right? So which means that if there are two different ways to arrange the execution of two different transactions, if at the end of the day, the two uh, schedules of the transaction end up with the same state for the database, right? Same uh, number of money in A, same number of money in A in B, as, as return the same results to the users, right? If the two uh, schedules have the same effect, uh, then we are going to call these two schedules equivalent. And this is independent of how those transactions are executed, right? Independent of what drawing algorithm you use, what index you use, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Make sense? So this will be called equivalent schedules. <laughs> and then finally, we are going to call a schedule a serializable schedule if such schedule is equivalent to some uh, serial schedule or serial execution of the transaction we talked about earlier, right? <laughs> so in this case, uh, looping back to our earlier example, right? If you interleave some operations in transaction A and B, right? Like, let's just go back, right? Yeah, here. If you on the left, if even though you interleave some operations uh, in the transaction uh, A and B, so on the left, the the 
the schedule of these two sessions itself is not serialized, but then it is uh, the effect of the transaction schedule on the left will be equivalent on the serial schedule on the right, right? So what we, what we, what we would just call the schedule on the left is serializable uh, schedule, okay? And then uh, this would be a uh, correct schedule uh, as, as far as uh, we concern for the heavy system. And again, looping back to the uh, earlier consistency, if each, each transaction is consistent, uh, then every serializable schedule uh, would also uh, be uh, consistent. Okay. Any question on this uh, terminology definition so far? Okay. So, so I mean, so far, one question you may have is that. Hey, like why this? We have to define this like complicated, like uh, equivalent schedule, serializable schedule, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> right? Couldn't we just say that? Hey, no matter which transaction arrived to the heavy system first, right? We need to execute that first, right? And then we need to have ensure a schedule that always uh, follow the order of when the when the transactions arrive to the heavy system, right? And then that would be the correct state of the heavy system. So why don't we do that? Well, the reason is actually pretty straightforward. Is that if we allow this uh, like more flexible definition of schedule, right? We allow the system to swap the execution order of different transactions, and then just ensure a final property equivalent to a a, a specific uh, serializable, uh, I mean, serialized uh, schedule. Then we actually allow many more uh, possible different scheduling of the database system to, to execute things, right? This will just uh, in, uh, allow the database system to interleave the operations uh, more flexibly and then potentially uh, more efficiently, right? That's just uh, pretty much uh, the reason why we define serializable this way instead of strictly following the order that they arrive to a database system. Make sense? Okay. So, <laughs> talk about how do we uh, ensure this uh, serializable property, right? Again, we are, we are not talking about the specific error concurrency control algorithm to ensure the, 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 uh, the query or the database system executes these transactions in a correct and efficient manner. For here, uh, this lecture, we're just going to talk about how we are going to analyze a specific schedule of a transaction uh, so that we know whether this uh, schedule is correct or not, right? We are going to talk about algorithms and implementations in later classes. So when we are trying to uh, determine whether a transaction schedule is serializable, we need to use an important concept here uh, called conflicting uh, operations, right? We need to know what we can do and what we cannot do so that we can ensure the serializable property of a transaction schedule. <laughs> so here, to define it more formally, we uh, call two operations or in two different transactions are conflict if, I mean, I mean obviously first, they are, they are operated by uh, different transactions, and second, if they are operating on the same object, right, but at least one of them is the right, then in this case, we would say, hey, these uh, operations on the two transactions would have a conflict, and then we'll use that to analyze whether a uh, specific transaction schedule is, is serializable or not. And to expand it a little bit, there are two, uh, th there are three different uh, possible uh, conflicts: uh, read-write uh, conflicts, write-read conflicts, and also a uh, write-write conflicts, right, depending on the type of operation you perform. There's actually another uh, special case called a phantom. So this is not entirely the all the the all the list of the anomalies, but we'll, again, we'll talk about it later because right, there's too many stuff here. So first, uh, the read-write conflict, right? So we uh, define the uh, read-write conflict. As, uh, in, in, as the, uh, in the uh, schedule of the transaction, that you cannot really repeat the read uh, you perform earlier in one transaction. So again, I'll give you a specific example that will be a little bit easier to understand. <laughs> in this case, assume that you first read uh, the value from the record A, right? assuming uh, this value is, is uh, 10, then you, then you read this uh, value uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, transaction two, the value is still 10, but then you can apply a change to the record A again, right? In this case, you would have a read on the left, but a write on the right, right? That would be called a read-write conflict. 
And in this case, after you uh, read this um, value from A again, you, you come back with a different value, right? And clearly this violates the isolation property, right? Because if A is the single transaction, you just cannot read a value uh, as 10, and then suddenly uh, it comes back as a value as 19, right? if T1 is the only transaction. So this would be a read-write conflict, and then uh, this a problem it will cause, it would be called unrepeatable reads. And then another example, right, would be the uh, inverse case, would be called a write-read conflict, or I mean, in term informal terminology, would be called a dirty write. So again, assume that you have this transaction T1, T2, first read, uh, T1 first read uh, record of value 10, and then write this value uh, back uh, to uh, uh, this value A as 12, right? <laughs> assume that later on, T2 reads the uh, value uh, 12, and then did a modification operations on the value uh, A and increment this value by two and make it 14, right? <laughs> In this case, if before T1 commits, T2 already read the value and then did the modification write the value back, and later on, I mean, this would be called a write read, right? First write and then read in T2. But later on, if T1 aborts, then uh, the trend, uh, see the habit system ended up in an invalid state, right? Because the T1 aborts, then the T1, I mean, none of the T1 should matter anymore. But what T2 does is that it reads the value A and increment it by two, right? So if T2 is the only transaction in the habit, the habit system, it just never, it can never reach this state, right? So this would be uh, incorrect as well. It's called dirty write or a write read conflict. Make sense? Okay. So uh, lastly, right, there could also be uh, write-write conflicts, right? So uh, in this case, you will be uh, overwriting uncommitted data. So again, transaction T1 and T2. T1 can first write a value uh, 10 uh, in A, and then uh, T2 can write a value I mean, 19 in A as well, right? <laughs> I mean, so far, this is fine, right? Because you can, I mean, overwrite uh, values, right? I mean, uh, this, this is actually uh, fine so far. But what if that <laughs> T2 later on write a value uh, in B, I mean to say Lin, and then T1 later on write a value uh, in B called Andrew, right? So the database system would end up in a state that it has the Andrew uh, value Andrew for B, but it has the value uh, 19 for A, right? I mean, this would be a right right conflict because the database system, I mean, if you execute either transaction isolatedly or if any serial order of transaction T1 or T2, I mean, T1 first, T2 first, or, 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 or like in the reverse, there's no way that the database system can end up in such state, right? And that would be called a right right conflict. And that's something that we also need to avoid uh, if we want uh, a transaction schedule to be serializable. Okay? Yeah, this is just not, not going to work. So one interesting thing uh, we can observe from this exercise is that we can observe the database system is actually, it actually doesn't try to uh, schedule this transaction. Actually, generally speaking, the database system doesn't really try to uh, come up with a very, very complicated or clever schedule of the transaction. Well, in real cases, it does, right? But generally speaking, generally speaking it's not. What it does is that it just allows uh, the transactions and the operations within each transactions to interleave each, with each other naturally, right? depending on when operation comes uh, or what operation is stored by a, a disk fetch so that it will need to switch to other transactions, but just interleave that happens. But the habit system usually just comes back and check whether there will be any uh, conflicts among a specific schedule of the transaction, right? So that it neither needs to abort or doing uh, some operations to handle that. We'll talk about it later, right? But generally speaking, it's, it's very difficult to know the um, exact operations of, of transactions in advance so that it can come up with a uh, clever, concrete scheduling of transactions ahead of time and then follow that, right? Okay, that's one observation. The other is that uh, there are actually uh, generally uh, two types of uh, serializable, serializability uh, that, uh, that um, I mean, uh, people define. The one is called a conflict serializability. That's, again, that's most database system would uh, try to uh, support, and that would just leverage uh, the uh, conflicts operations that we talked about earlier, right? That's the most common case. There's also a other case called view serializability that is um, actually pretty rare, right? Because that's actually uh, more flexible, even more flexible than conflict serializability, right? It, uh, it would allow a more, inter more possible interleaving and possibly uh, make the database system more efficient, but that actually requires 
a little bit understanding of the semantics of the application and what it's actually, it's actually trying to do, right? instead of just read and write. And in practice, uh, that's, that's very, very difficult. And, and pretty much uh, no, no, nobody can really do that. Right? But that definition exists. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now let me just, uh, I mean, define this. We'll give some example, right? But for here, we have to uh, formally define a uh, conflict serializable schedule. So we say if two schedules are conflict equivalent, if, I mean, first of all, obviously, they need to involve the same set of actions or operations of the same set of transactions, right? And second, if every pair of the conflicting uh, transactions are, is ordered in the same way, right? Assuming that I mean, if you, uh, sorry, every pair of the conflicting actions are the same in the same way, right? Assume you have one transaction schedule, another transaction schedule, right? There are, I mean, different uh, conflicts in one schedule and the other, and the conflicts in one schedule, right, would be the same set of conflicts and follow the same order as, as the other schedule. And then we will tell, call these two schedule uh, conflict equivalent. And then the, the straightforward conflict serializable definition would just be that if one schedule is conflict equivalent to some uh, serial schedule, okay? Uh, we'll give examples, right? But just bear with me. <laughs> Let me go through the formal definition, okay? <laughs> so what we are going to, uh, how we are going to check whether a schedule is conflict serializable is that we are going to see whether we can transform a schedule S into a serial schedule uh, by swapping a uh, consecutive non-conflicting operations of different transactions, right? So that for the uh, conflict operations or actions of two different schedules, we cannot change them, but we can swap on conflict operations, I mean, as far as we want, right? And if by such swapping, we can make the two transactions, sorry, make the two schedules of transactions end up to be the same, then they will be conflict serializable, okay? Let me uh, get to the examples, right? It will, be, uh, it will be easier this way, okay? So <laughs> assume that we have this uh, transaction T1 and T2. Uh, T1 first read and write on A, and T2 write, read and write on A, and T T1 do the read and write, read and write, right? So same operations, but have the interleaving. So we can first look at this. Um, so we want, to, we want to know whether these two transactions are conflict uh, equivalent, right? So what we do is that we can look at the non-conflict pairs in the transaction. In this case, would be read on B, write on A. Well, they are operating on different records, right? So obviously they are not conflict, right? So we can just swap these operations. And similarly, look at other records, A on B, not conflict, right? Swap them, and a similar again, right? It's like, uh, these are different records, not conflict, and then we can swap all of them, right? So at the end of the day, we can make them in a state that you execute all the operations on T1 first, and then or execute uh, all the operations on T2 later, right? So these transactions, original transaction on the left will be conflict equivalent to a serializable uh, transaction on the right. In fact, it's like a T1 first and T2 second. And in this case, T the original transaction scheduling will be conflict serializable, and it will be a valid execution of a transaction schedule. Make sense? Cool, cool, pretty cool. All right, it looks at some, uh, just like a bad example, right? Let's say you have a, a transaction uh, T1, like read on A, and then transaction T2, read on A, write on A, transaction T1, write on A again, right? So we can, again, try to swap things and make this uh, conflict serializable. But in this case, if we want to make it conflict serializable, right, we have to swap the write on A. For example, if we want to T1 execute first, then we have to swap the record on A up, right? But in this case, we just can't because no matter whether you swap right on A with from transaction T1 with the right on A or right on A or with read on A or right on A transaction T2, they are all con conflicts, right? So you cannot swap. So this will not be a conflict serializable transaction. And in fact, it's invalid. Okay. And then, yeah, I mean, serializability just defines as like uh, swapping operations uh, so that uh, we can just uh, make uh, two uh, transaction schedule uh, the same. Uh, uh, but one uh, thing that we probably noticed so far is that, well, it's a little bit cumbersome if we, uh, when we want to define or determine whether a transaction is uh, correct or serializable or not, we just start with this like, random swapping over and over again, right? That's like lots of overhead and it takes uh, lots of time uh, to uh, compute or to determine whether a schedule is uh, 
correct or not, or serializable or not. So whether there will be any algorithm, there will be a smarter way to help us to do that. Well, it turns out there definitely is. So the uh, better way, or the algorithm, to help us to uh, determine whether a transaction is a conflict, or trans whether a transaction schedule is a conflict serializable, is called dependency graphs, right? So what we do here is that for uh, every node, uh, for, for, sorry, for every transaction in the transaction schedule, we are going to define a node uh, in this uh, dependency graph, right? So we are going to define a edge, it's, a, it's actually a directed edge, right? We are going to define an edge from transaction TI to transaction TJ if there's an operation uh, OI of transaction TI conflicts I mean, with another operation on TJ. Uh, furthermore, this um, operation uh, OI on transaction TI needs to happen earlier than the operation OJ uh, on uh, the transaction TJ, right? Then there will be a directed graph from, uh, sorry, there will be a directed edge from transaction T1 to TI to TJ in the dependency graph, right? And uh, I mean, in some textbook, it will be called a precedence graph as well. And then with this, uh, I mean, simple graph, if you will, the way to determine whether a schedule is a conflict serializable is actually straightforward. It just look at whether there will be a cycles in this graph, right? If there is cycle, no matter how you swapping uh, transactions, at the end of the day, you will never be able to uh, re-swap uh, operations and then make this uh, transaction schedule to be equivalent uh, to a serial, serial schedule. And if there's no cycle, then I mean you can always f figure out some swapping uh, to so that you can make the uh, operation in one schedule to be equivalent to a serial schedule. Make sense intuitively? Okay. Nice, nice. So we'll give you some examples <laughs> here uh, in this uh, first example. Right, we uh, again have a transaction T1 and T2. It's actually an example we showed earlier, right? Just to read write on A and then read write on B, right? The other way is the same. So in this case, what are the conflicts? I mean, there are definitely conflicts, right? For example, here, there's a write read conflict, right? With the operation on T1 happen first. Right? So what we'll do here? We'll have a directed edge from T1 to T2, right? <laughs> then there's another uh, write read conflict, right? From a transaction T2 to transaction T1. What do we do here? We'll have a uh, oil edge from T2 to T1. Yeah. So in this case, this this transaction is actually not conflict uh, serializable, right? Because there's a cycle in this graph. Make sense? And you can just not swap, be able to swap it to make it the same. On the other example, right? <laughs> Say there's again more complicated example, transaction T1 and T2 and T3. And first, I mean there's a uh, conflict from the transaction uh, uh, T1 to T2, but then it's a write-read conflict, right? Because the write happens first. So it will be a T1 to T2. And then there will be another conflict uh, uh, that has a, a write-read conflict uh, from T1 to T3 as well, right? But in the, there will be no other conflicts in this graph, right? Because you can look at, you can check the record, right? I mean, all the record, other records are on uh, different values, or both of them are read, so there's no conflicts. So in this case, it will be uh, equivalent to the uh, serial execution of the transactions, namely uh, T1, T2, T1, T3, uh, such that this schedule would actually be a conflict serializable schedule, and then it will be correct. And transactions are, are isolated, and we, we can ensure the correct properties of the data. Okay. So uh, what do we? I mean, look back. Look, look, look back to the. Uh, uh, okay, so let me give you an example here, right? We can talk about what issues uh, later. So assuming that, I mean, here, not only I'm, I'm denoting uh, the read-write operations, right? So I'm, I come back, just hypothetically, right? In the, in the dependency graph, we don't have this information, but hypothetically, I add back to what operations uh, the application code will do inside those transactions, right? Just to give you an illustration. So here, we can uh, look at this uh, com conflict graph. It's here, uh, it deducts a value uh, A, Right, so and we um, and it, it well we talk about a and look at the sum, right, and then I mean echo the sum out, right. In this case, it will be a write read uh, conflict, and then we can uh, draw this graph and also a read write conflict. Right? We can also draw the graph as well, <laughs> and in this case, obviously again, this is a uh, invalid uh, transaction state, right, and it is not uh, it's not conflict serializable. 
But, but in fact, what if there are some application semantics from this uh, transaction that uh, we hypothetically can know, right? For example, instead of looking at the sum of A and B, right, which, I mean, if you schedule the transaction this way, it will conflict, and uh, just, uh, the result would be uh, inconsistent. But what if we have some notion or understanding of the semantics of the transaction, and what if the such semantics the transaction needs to perform is a little bit loose, right? Let's say, instead of looking at the summation of the values A and B, we just care about, hey, how many values are greater than zero, right? And as, again, assume in this case that even though you deduct uh, $10 from A, and whether you deduct or not, it will always greater than zero. Right? In this case, even though this transaction is not conflict serializable, but at the end of the day, if all transaction B cares about is that how many values would be uh, greater than zero, and if assuming that A uh, is always going to be uh, greater than zero, then in this case, even though that from the conflict serializable definition perspective, this scheduling is wrong, but then in practice, this schedule actually returns the correct result, right? Because, I mean, I mean T2 will always return two if both A and B are greater than zero, right? Again, assuming A has enough balance, and also, T2 only reads things, right? It never writes things back. So no matter how you interleave the operations in B with A, at the end of the day, all the records in that data system would also end up the same, right? So strictly speaking, the execution result or outcome of this transaction is actually correct, right? But just in practice, because it's very difficult to have a system to know, hey, what do you really want to do with the record? What's the semantics of this, right? So in, in, in practice, we just look at whether this is a read or a write, and we define conflict graph on this read and write, and we, we, we use a little bit stricter approach, or more strict approach, uh, to determine whether a schedule is uh, correct or not. It's a little bit more conservative, but that's, uh, in most cases, that's what we can do, right? So this gives you a little bit um, heads up on the uh, view serializability, right? The view serializability, which would be the case that assume that you know a little bit more about the semantics of the transactions, right? You, then you can give a little bit lean way, right? So you can potentially allow a more possible or flexible transaction executions and uh, not abort the above transaction, uh, not abort, abort the uh, earlier scheduling. Uh, but, but in practice, that's uh, very difficult to do. And we actually, uh, I'm go not going to read these uh, things uh, here today because it's not used, uh, it's, and in, as far as I know, it's not really used in a practical system implementation, uh, but you can check it out later, okay? So, I, but I can give you a uh, more a con a concrete example, right, to, so you can understand, uh, because it's, it is a, a formal definition of serializability, right? <laughs> Say you have these uh, three transactions here, right, T1, T2, T3. Again, I draw the dependency graph, just read-write, and then there's a uh, read-write, and then, uh, yeah, there's uh, many, many uh, conflicts, right? Okay? But then, <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's not a conflict serializable transaction schedule, and according to our standard, I mean, this cannot happen. We have to abort. Right? But if, if you actually look at these uh, transactions, right, they're just doing blind writes on A, right? So the first transaction reads a value from A, but then it just writes the value, value back, and then I never read it again. And then for uh, transaction T3, it's the last transaction to write a value, and well, it actually, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you do with T1 and T2, right? Because if you write the value um, in transaction T3 at the end, well, then at the end of the day, the database system just has that single record, right? So in this case, it is, I mean, in terms of the eventual outcome, I mean, this could actually be equivalent to, for example, execute T1 first, T2 second, and, and T3 third, right? The outcome would be the same. Uh, but, but according to our schedule, this is not allowed. Yeah, essentially, that's, that's what it shows here, right? Make sense? Right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is actually essentially allows not only a ske serializable schedule, but also allows this a bland write, right? If you never read the record, you just write a new value, then at the end of the day, it, it's the same, right? Because the, the value that T3 write is not dependent on any other value read or write earlier, okay? So uh, uh, again, this is almost summarize that. Essentially, a view serializability allows more possible scheduling uh, than a conflict uh, serializability. And uh, well, uh, and, and, and essentially, uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to, to, to uh, 
to, for the library system to know the semantics of the operation to achieve uh, view serializability. And actually, neither definition actually uh, allows uh, all the possible schedules that would consider serializable because beyond the blind writes, there are actually other possible operations that if you know the semantics of the, of the transaction ahead of time, right? let's say if you know what exactly is going to happen, the exact read-write set on each individual record and the exact operation you're going to perform, there are many other potential schedules you can perform. But the database is just a I mean, difficult database system to know that. So in practice, it's mostly we only care about conflict serializability. Okay, and uh, just, uh, just uh, remind a little bit that in some uh, real cases, some system would actually look at what's inside the transaction, right? So it's not uh, totally 100%. And in some cases, I mean, in some cases, the database system could look at what's exactly in the transaction and do a scheduling, allow more possibility. And in some cases, right, it, this will, the database system would uh, also uh, push a little bit of flexibility to the application level, right? So that if the application, I mean, specify that, hey, it would, it would allow a certain side type of conflict because of certain or certain properties, then it's, it's also possible, okay? Okay, to uh, summarize uh, today's, uh, I mean, uh, today's, uh, the, 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 the different, uh, properties of uh, uh, schedules we talked about earlier, right? Let's assume that this is the entire set of possible schedules of a set of transactions, right? This is like all possible schedules. Then the serial schedule will just be a very uh, small set, right? With, with no interleaving among uh, transactions whatsoever. Then conflict serializable would be obviously bigger than that, right? You can interleaving certain operations, but then <laughs> there cannot be any cycle, right? In the conflict graphs, I mean, de de defined by the three conflict, uh, three types of conflicts uh, earlier, right? There can be any uh, any uh, cycle in the uh, dependency graph that will be called uh, conflict serializable transactions. And then view serializable is actually uh, strictly bigger than that, right? It allows all the conflict serializable transactions, but it also allow other uh, transaction scheduling as well, such as you have a blind write, as we talked about earlier. And then uh, for durability, right? So uh, again, we'll talk about more uh, durability with recovery, but uh, uh, to uh, ensure the uh, correct state of the database, we also need to ensure that when we commit a transaction, we have to apply all the changes uh, to the persistent storage, such as a disk, right? So that there's no uh, partial update, and there's no like, uh, or like a torn update, or there's no like, uh, uh, updates from a ex transaction that only executed one or two statements but didn't finish the rest, right? And then there will be uh, logging or shadow paging to ensure those uh, properties, okay? So to uh, make a summarization of the asset properties we talked about earlier, because this is very important, you will hear this uh, term uh, many, many times uh, in the lecture, as well as later on if you deal with the database, you, I mean, you will deal with those properties uh, all the time. Automicity, everything happens uh, all together. It's either all or nothing, right? Like transactions is a basic unit. And then consistency, right? If the database is, is, is in a uh, consistent state, certain satisfies certain properties, right? We give examples earlier. Then if a transaction is also consistent, then a consistent transaction applied on a consistent database state would result in a consistent database state, okay? And then isolation, I mean, every, the execution of every transaction I mean, is as isolated as if uh, the database system is handling that transaction alone. And finally, durability, uh, if a transaction commits, then the effects always uh, persist. Okay? So any uh, question about like, serializability, uh, acid, et cetera, before we just uh, go to the conclusion? No? Okay, nice. <laughs> So just to uh, sum uh, everything up, concurrency, control, uh, we talk about this class, and recovery, we'll talk about the future, a few lectures later, are uh, among the most important functions uh, provided by a uh, database system, right? For the acid property, mostly they are all related to uh, concurrency control and recovery. And these are just a super, super important why the database system even exists in the first place, right? Just because it is not only trying to save, restore, and retrieve data efficiently, but also try to handle those um, complicated uh, cases involved with database, with data management, right? Such as different users accessing power failures, et cetera. It deals with all those things for the developers so that users or the developers only need to focus about, uh, focus on their application logic. <laughs> and also 
Congress in control, as well as recovery, they all happen automatically, right? The users don't really issue the database system and say that, hey, if I'm um, executing this operation, I cannot execute in the other operation, or I need to put a lock on this record or that record, etc. right? Users don't specify any of those things. The database system handles everything automatically, right? So again, so that the users can uh, use the database system easily, all right? So just want to mention that there will be some uh, argument that's saying that, hey, I mean, if you, uh, you put these things in the database system, then will this be uh, less efficient, right? Similar to the example of the compiler, people, the argument that people put on compiler or compilerization, people, some people will argue that, hey, if you just let users to specify the order of different transactions or specifies uh, what type of conflicts they allow, they don't allow, and what scheduling uh, possibility out there, will that be more efficient, right? But then there was this uh, famous uh, paper from Google talk about their spanner system. It's like their globally uh, distributed database, right? Uh, uh, ensures lots of these acid uh, property. They actually have a paragraph to confirm that Google believes it will be better to have application programmers to deal with the performance problem due to overuse of transactions, right? Such as a bottleneck when, when bottleneck arises, rather than just actually always, uh, I mean, writing code to um, cope with the different issues of the data due to the lack of transactions, right? So it's just in practice, people just found out that hey, just a very very inefficient. At the end of the day, if the uh, application developers need to deal with these uh, transactions, even though theoretically they may come up with uh, better scheduling and potentially more efficient scheduling, but uh, in most cases, if the database system um, um, deal with the transactions, they can actually put, put their energy among more important things that, that things that and can create uh, more values. All right. So uh, this is all today. Uh, next class, we are going to talk about the specifics. I right? will talk about how do we actually use the two-phase locking algorithm to ensure the, uh, these uh, properties we talk about in the concurrency control mechanism, as well as we will talk about the different levels of isolations. The St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus, it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The fees are set, then grab a 40. The flim New York and snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.